Welcome everybody to uh, this Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society talk, uh, which is the Priestly Lecture. Uh, my name is Eric Blair, I'm president of the Leeds Phil and Lit, and uh, the Priestly Lecture is an annual event that's run by um, LPLS, uh, the Leeds Library and Mill Hill Chapel. Um, so I, I, I give a particularly warm welcome to anybody who, who's here who's come through uh, the, the Leeds Library or, or Mill Hill Chapel. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome to you all. Mm. Um, just before handing over to uh, our event secretary, Rachel, um, could, could I just say a little bit uh, about the Priestly lecture and about Priestly himself? Um, I think by any standards, Priestley was a, a very, very remarkable man uh, by the standards of his day or even, even today. Um, he was born in Bristol uh, near Leeds in 1733. And uh, our particular focus of Leeds interest is that he was uh, uh, the Unitarian minister of uh, Mill Hill Chapel um, in 1767. And uh, he was also the first secretary of the Leeds Library, uh, which was founded in 1768. Um, so there's lots of connections there. Um, I mean, we think of him uh, as a scientist, but uh, he was much more than a scientist. Uh, I think nowadays he'd be he'd be called a, a, a radical cleric. I think he was a, a man who questioned just about everything in his science, his society, and even and his own religion. And he, he, he got into a lot of hot water about, about all, of these, uh, all of these issues. Um, he, he, uh, he, he was a supporter of the, uh, the rights of, of men and women. Uh, he was a very, very strong on women's right. education. And, uh, and, and he, uh, uh, as a supporter of the French Revolution, uh, uh, was, was given a French citizenship actually by the Revolutionary Committee and all, all of this got um, uh, very hot for him and his next his charge after, after Leeds was Birmingham and, and uh, there, was, there was a lot of trouble there. His house was burned down and his uh, laboratory and scientific instruments uh, were, uh, were destroyed. Uh, eventually in 1794 he left Britain for America uh, and lived the rest of his life, um, I think, quite peacefully in Northumberland, Pennsylvania. Uh, we think of him mainly as a discoverer of, of, of oxygen, um, which he, he discovered by, by uh, focusing sunbeams on mercuric oxide. And uh, he defined a, a number of different sorts of air. Uh, oxygen, we probably all kind of remember from our school textbooks, he, described as deflogisticated air, uh, but the, he defined other sorts of air, airs as well, like nitrous air, uh, acid air, and alkaline air. Uh, so he, he was a great polymath and a, um, a, a, a wonderful and probably quite difficult person. <laughs> um, mentioning all of these airs, of course, uh, uh, you know, takes us into uh, tonight's lecture um, from Professor Kath Noakes at the University of Leeds. And I'm gonna hand over to our event secretary, Dr. Rachel Unsworth, uh, who's going to introduce our speaker. Um, Rachel, I, I, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Sorry, I thought you hadn't muted me. Oh, okay. Kath <laughs> um, Noakes, who did both her first degree and PhD at Leeds, became Professor of Environmental Engineering of Buildings in 2014. She's also Deputy Director of the Leeds Institute for Fluid Dynamics. And as Jim Al-Khalili reminded us when Kath was his guest on the Life Scientific early in the year, fluids can be liquids or gases. And it's in the study of the movement of air that Kath's made her mark. We've never been more conscious of the air we breathe one way or another. 
think. Um, and Kath's research focuses on infection risk in the built environment, understanding the physical mechanisms of infection transmission, and then the engineering strategies to reduce risk and control it. Her influence and reputation have risen significantly through her role since April 2020 as one of around 90 scientists on the UK government's Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, or SAGE as we know it, work proceeded at an amazing rate to bring evidence into policy making and hands, face and space is a part of what she's been involved in. And she wishes, I think, that ventilation was a snappier word. Uh, she's been invited to be a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and was awarded an OBE last year for services to the COVID-19 response. I'm sure she wouldn't uh, show off about these things herself, so we're showing off on her behalf. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Kath. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Rachel, for that. Uh, let me get my screen to share. Okay, let's give that a moment to come up. Hopefully you should be able to see my slides and hear me. So, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk today. And I'm gonna um, sort of share with you some of, I suppose, an understanding of how we've developed our, our view of how this disease transmits, some of the real challenges and complexities of it, some of what it means for the future, and also touch a little bit on um, the experience I've had of, and many others have had of how we deliver science in the public eye. Um, so let's start off with, I guess, putting this into context. And if we look at uh, the World Health Organization's data, um, they do a top 10 causes of death. And it's, it's a little bit out of date now, but uh, not far off this. And so every year, the, the, these, the, the, the causes you see on here are the, you know, the top 10 causes of death globally. And to start with, we can see that respiratory disease features quite heavily in there. Tuberculosis is a respiratory disease. We've got lower respiratory infections. And then we have a number of other diseases in here, like um, lung cancers, dementia, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, stroke and heart disease, which are perhaps not so much um, caused by infectious pathogens, but are related to air quality and the quality of the air that we breathe. So you can actually see that the air has a really significant contributor to the global burden of death um, all around the world. We then put coronavirus into this, you can see that this starts to dwarf things. So um, sadly, we crossed over the, the, the boundary to 5 million global deaths um, about two days ago. Um, that is probably an underestimate, probably a very significant underestimate because of the challenge of counting uh, deaths in different countries around the world. Um, but you can see that it's, uh, although this has happened over perhaps a, closer to a two year period, you can see that it's sitting up there is probably one of the most significant causes of death worldwide at the moment. And when we add in the number of cases, it is, it's a bit of an unprecedented event that we've all experienced. And I think when we look at the cost of this too, um, although we shouldn't necessarily monetize everything, it is an incredible figure. It's been estimated around a trillion dollars a month in the global harm, both in terms of the direct health effects and all the indirect effects associated with things like uh, restrictions and lockdowns and disruption to life. And, and that, of course, is you know, still ongoing um, in many countries around the world. But this is not new. So the environment and disease transmission has always been there. We've always known it. We've known that the environments that we live in affect the diseases, uh, affect the risks of our diseases, uh, of, of contracting diseases, and of them spreading in those environments. And we go back to Florence Nightingale in uh, 1859, um, and before that, she, where she noted that in the Crimean War, um, that the transmission of, of infections amongst uh, soldiers was influenced by the environment that, that they were in. And she saw more infections in those who were in uh, very um, enclosed environments with poor ventilation, poor light. And she basically advocated, very rightly so, that a hospital should do no harm and that she advocated for high ceilings, good ventilation, um, good natural light, 
spacing between the beds, etc. And she, she, she showed that putting these things in place resulted in lower infection transmission in these environments. Um, we've known for a long time that uh, respiratory um, droplets contain bacteria, and you can go back to experiments conducted in 1897, uh, which showed that these you know, bacteria will settle at least two meters away. And then uh, there's, there's some lovely documents around the um, House of Commons ventilation. Funnily enough, I pulled these out when uh, uh, there was a bit of the government debate around uh, the distance with which things could go. Um, and they highlighted that, uh, you know, the, the bacterial contamination in the air in the House of Commons um, and that, um, oops, sorry, gone up too quickly, um, and, and highlighted that this was associated with the mouth and upper respiratory packages, passages of people speaking, coughing and sneezing within the debating chamber. Um, so, you know, this is, this is not new stuff. But in terms of actually understanding how diseases transmit, that's actually quite a big challenge. And probably one of the first sort of proper scientific studies around this was carried out um, the late 50s, early 60s. Um, came from a really seminal work by a chap called William Wells. He's the guy in the black and white photograph. Um, he was at Harvard and in the, in the 1930s, he, he worked on tuberculosis and he proposed the idea that we had something called a droplet nuclei, which was basically when we uh, breathe or cough or talk, that the, the droplets that carry a bacteria in this case would evaporate and become much smaller and then would remain suspended in the air because they were now so small. And he worked with another chap called Richard Riley, who's the, the, uh, the guy in the check shirt in the photograph, um, on a seminal study um, to measure the, the transmission of tuberculosis. And basically, if you go back in history, you look at tuberculosis, it was seen as a droplet disease. It was, it was highlighted, suggested that, you know, spitting caused TB. Um, you can find all sorts of papers and, and you know, public information around this. Um, but he basically took the ward air from a hospital, passed it through a ventilation duct and stuck a cage of guinea pigs on the roof of the ward. And what he found was these guinea pigs got infected and they very consistently got infected. There was no other connection between the guinea pigs and these patients. So the only explanation was that, that um, the, the bacteria that caused TB passed through those air ducts into those cages of guinea pigs and they were caught infection that way. So he demonstrated conclusively that even though you can not for, even now we cannot sample the TB bacteria out the air and grow it on an agar plate, which is very hard to do. Um, he showed it was transmitted through the air. He also at the same time put ultraviolet disinfection into these spaces and he showed that when that was in the space, there were less guinea pigs infected. So highlighted the possible control mechanism there. If we take this on a little bit further, um, so that was in 1958 to 62, uh, that study was repeated in the early 2000s. I was quite fortunate to be involved in this study. It was carried out in Lima in Peru and um, was essentially the same idea. You take the ward air from a, a TB hospital, you pass it through cages which contain guinea pigs on the roof of the hospital and you measure transmission. Well, I had an involvement there because uh, I, I basically did all the ventilation calculations for the flow rates through all of these um, spaces, um, but it wasn't my study to run. Um, but what we could find in that study was that as well as being able to show the same thing, that TB transmission was airborne and that we could use ultraviolet disinfection, because we've now got genomic techniques, we could um, identify that certain patients infected certain guinea pigs you could directly match them up together and what we started to show there was the concept of a super spreader so that some patients infected far more guinea pigs than others. Um, the study on the right is an attempt to look at how flu transmits so this was you know, not that many years ago in fact this study was commissioned after the 2009 flu pandemic um, and was brought in because we don't really know how flu transmits. So, you know, it's we're often told wash your hands, we're often told it's droplets, but then there is two, we've certainly measured influenza viruses in the air. And this was a this was a 
huge expensive study um, funded by uh, the Centers for Disease Control in the States, um, where basically we infected uh, volunteers and some of those volunteers, then those volunteers interacted with others and we were hoping to see transmission. We didn't unfortunately see very much transmission in any of the studies. Um, we learned an awful lot about how to conduct these types of studies and learned that actually, um, you know, it was quite possibly because it comes down to this super spreading again and that the people who were shedding the virus in the study were just not shedding very much at all. But these are just three studies. There are, there are others out there, though there are not that many which seek to prove transmission routes by these really big uh, complex studies involving human volunteers. Um, but it highlights that that debate and that understanding of transmission has been around for quite a long time. And then a pandemic comes along last year. And I think what this has done is brought all of that past research plus a whole raft of other things to the fore. And it's allowed us to explore in a lot more detail what our understanding of transmission is. It's allowed us to think through those processes of transmission. It's highlighted some long-term challenges, which I'll talk a little bit more about around our buildings. It's highlighted again, I'll talk about this, about the behavioral interfaces with, um, between buildings and people. And it's put science in the spotlight in a way that it never, we've never been like this before. Um, then there's some good in there. There's also some bad in there. So these are the key things I want to focus on in, in the rest of the lecture today. Um, I start though by just going into what we understand about transmission. So this is a respiratory disease. Um, uh, the photo is, is actually just a guy spitting, unfortunately it's faked, but it gives you an illustration that this is a, a disease that is uh, spread through respiratory actions. Um, and those may well be uh, breathing, coughing, talking, singing, unfortunately, um, sneezing, etc., cetera, uh, are all things that could potentially transmit the disease. It is also possible that the certain treatments or environmental actions could uh, could um, enhance this um, release. And it is also possible, although it's, it's, there's not much evidence for it, that this, the virus could also be shed in feces, which may create an environmental source through uh, aerosols from um, wa uh, wastewater systems. Whatever it is, it's released in these liquid aerosols and droplets at a particular distribution of size. And I'll talk about sizes in a minute. Um, and it's released, well, wherever your infectious source is, at a particular location and for a particular duration of time. And, you know, people don't necessarily transmit or emit virus continuously if they're infected. It may well be influenced quite heavily by their activities that they're doing at the time. Once these particles are released into the air, they are transported through the air, they will be carried by ventilation systems, and some of them will deposit onto surfaces. And eventually people will be exposed. And when people are close together, you can see this is a smoke video, you get a, a very cl close plume, but then that gets dispersed in an environment. There are different routes to exposure, so we can inhale those, the smallest aerosols, we can inhale them when they're the very smallest ones at long range, we can inhale larger and smaller ones at close range. And then the very large droplets can either deposit onto surfaces or, direct, or directly onto mucous membranes. And if they deposit onto surfaces, then potentially we can touch them, touch your, touch your mucous membranes and infect in that way. But this whole process is really complex. It is a complex interaction of the virus itself and how that behaves, how it survives, the human characteristics of the people involved and the fluid dynamics, the ventilation flows, the aerosol behaviours, all of those factors that, that come together. So actually understanding this is really challenging. And even if we get the virus and the fluid dynamics bit right, the people make it really difficult to work out. If we look at how we understand transmission, and I highlighted already some of the past studies that have looked at this, we've got this novel pathogen, we're trying to collect information very quickly. 
And there are essentially two different groups of studies that we can do to find out how these things transmit. The first group, the, the blue boxes at the top of the screen, are all of the, the data that we get from real world transmission. So we get data from outbreak investigations, we get the population level data. Most of that comes from the in the UK from the NHS Test and Trace system, which um, has its issues, but actually provides an incredibly rich data set. Um, with certain space places, they sequence the virus, and that gives us an understanding of how new variants are transmitted to the population. And then you can take some of this data and do more complex studies with it. So you can follow cohorts of people over time, or you can uh, do what you call a case control study where you uh, sort of compare one group with another group and look at differences. And all of this real world stuff tells us where the virus is in the population. It tells us some of the risk factors for environment, but it doesn't tell us the detail of the mechanism of how it transmits. It just gives us some hints as to where to go and look. So we have a second group of studies, the green boxes at the bottom, where we can start to unpick some of the details. So we can use animal models, um, hamsters are particularly popular for this one, to look at um, uh, modes of transmission and try and understand whether it's small aerosols or droplets or the time it takes or the infectious dose. We can do laboratory studies directly with the virus if we've got the right level of um, microbial containment in a laboratory, it is a, a dangerous pathogen, so it has to be done under quite strict conditions. But we can look at how it survives and how it responds to things like temperature or humidity or survival on surfaces. And then we can use mechanistic models and epidemic models to actually simulate some of the processes around transmission, simulate some of the interactions and look at, do some what ifs and look at what the likely scenarios are. But none of these studies, no one thing gives us the answer. So we have to try and put all of this together. And each time we get some data, it's another little tiny piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, we know that it's complicated. There are multiple routes and multiple risk factors. And not everything is immediately what it seems. And by that, I mean, we might see a press report that suggests, say, there's an outbreak at a particular workplace. Our immediate reaction when we see that is to think that workplace is unsafe, to think that there is some transmission in their office or something like that. It's not always the case. Quite often what you find is that workplaces are a hub for a community and people who work together also live together. They socialise together, they share cars together. And there's a lot of other interactions that actually mean that not all the transmission is necessarily where you think it is. What we have found, I think, over the past 18 months is we've identified sets of risk factors. So we know that, that um, this virus loves people. It loves um, it transmits in uh, spaces which have high numbers of people with poor ventilation, where we share those spaces. And it, we also know that it favours low humidity, it favours low temperature, although that's probably less of a challenge in our real world environments. It's probably the ventilation and the sharing that matters more. Um, and then we know there's a bunch of human factors. So we actually know that activities and breathing rates are really significant. It seems to be highest risk of transmission is when people are doing continuous talking or singing, more so than coughing. And when people are doing significant aerobic exercise, so there seems to be a number of outbreaks associated with these risk factors. We know that if you're exposed over longer periods of time, particularly in a household, your chances of contracting it are higher. Um, we know that, that certain communities have higher rates of transmission, which are all linked to socioeconomic factors around quality of housing, type of workplaces, travel behaviours, etc as well as their contact frequencies networks and hygiene behaviors so there's a whole raft of things that are all interlinked together often very hard to quantify now my interest is mainly in the buildings buildings are part of this they set some of the conditions they enable us to interact or not as the case may be but they don't behave manage everything so you know you can have a, a space which you you have got a limited number of people in, you can make sure the ventilation's good, you can put you know, your, your hand sanitizer in place and ask people if they'll wear masks. But ultimately what happens is people interact together and they, their behaviors will probably dominate a lot of the time. 
So going back into some of the technical of this, um, aerosol droplet, there's been quite a lot of debate over the past 18 months over whether something is an aerosol, whether it's a droplet. And there is some importance in this. So if we go into the infectious diseases community, um, an aerosol is defined as something that's below five microns in diameter, so very tiny, suspended in the air and can be inhaled into the deep lung. And then they say that anything above five microns in diameter um, tends to be upper respiratory exposure, which is true. But the mistake there is that it's stated it will drop out of the air within about a metre. And we know that that's actually not true. Some bigger particles go further than a metre. If we look at aerosol science, they will define anything up to 100 microns in, as, a, as an, an aerosol. And those are things that are inhalable. Some of them will evaporate and some will be transported in the air. And then they say anything above, above 100 microns is something that deposits and lands very quickly and behaves ballistically. If we go to the public, it gets more complicated further because an aerosol there is often a spray can, a deodorant or a spray paint, and droplets are like raindrops or spit. And so, it, first of all, we've got different words that are used by different people to mean sometimes the same thing, sometimes different things. If we think about where this virus actually is, well, when we breathe, talk, sing, etc., we ex exhale particles that range from under one micron in size to over a millimetre, the very large spit droplets. So the virus itself is tiny. It's 100 nanometers in diameter, which is 0.1 of a micron but it doesn't travel on its own. It's contained with respiratory fluids. So there are things around it. So it's never quite as small as just the virus on its own. Um, and if we start thinking about sizes, um, imagine this is a 100 micron particle, my screen. A human hair is about 60 microns in diameter. And you can see well, I possibly can't, my eyesight's not that good, but if you've got reasonably good eyesight, you can see down to about 40 microns. This would be our 10 micron particle. So you can see we're now getting pretty small and our one micron particle is tiny. So just about everything that matters significantly with this disease is, is smaller than we can see. There are, a very, there are a small number of big particles that we generate most of the particles we generate are very small or become very small. And actually, this is really complex then. So um, this actually is really quite a nice diagram which shows the different sizes of aerosols and droplets that we generate and how they behave. And um, we get that the very largest ones, the, what we call the nasal pharynx, well, sorry, the very largest ones, ballistic droplets are the ones that fly. We've probably all met a spit talker in our lives or our children are quite good at that. Um, we then get these nasopharyngeal ones which are, are large. They don't stay around that long but if you're close to somebody you can inhale them, they'll end up in your upper respiratory tract. And then we get progressively smaller and smaller and it's the very tiniest ones that can stay in the air and travel long distances. But the further you get from somebody the more dilute they get the better the ventilation, the more dilute they get. And this also illustrates the effect that masks will have um, in that they will block most of the large ones and even a percentage of the small ones um, in, and therefore can quite significantly reduce um, both emissions and exposure. <clears throat> the other thing I think we've learned is a huge amount of variability between people. So this graph shows particles from people. So there's a number of people who were all asked to go and breathe in a, a, into, a, into a, a particle counter. And it isn't measuring virus at all. It's just measuring how many particles people exhale. And they were asked to do different activities. And what you can see is if people speak more loudly or sing more loudly as the decibels go up, they generate more particles. And people singing, happy birthday or shouting happy birthday, it's quite hard to speak at 100 to 90 decibels, um, is comparable to the, the numbers of particles people produce when they cough. But the other really interesting thing in here is if you look at the, the one that says breathing, what you can see is all each one of those dots is an individual person and their results. And those, those, those dots cover really quite a significant range. And that tells you that some people 
can generate as many particles when they breathe as others do when they cough or sing. Whereas some people generate hardly anything. And this huge variation is one of the major challenges. When we add this huge variation in individuals together with huge variation in viral loads, we end up with something really quite complex. And the ones I've just shown you there were for particles. This is for respiratory pathogens. Now this is influenza. Um, when I put these slides together, this hadn't been measured, but actually it had been measured a few weeks ago in um, for the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but we haven't got quite such nice data for that yet. But this is a machine that's uh, by a group in uh, the University of Maryland in the US. And the machine is called a gazum type machine. Um, um, and it, it basically measures the amount of virus in exhaled breath and it segregates it into whether it's fine aerosols, which are smaller than five micron diameter or coarse aerosols, which are larger. And they measured influenza um, for people just wild cases, they would bring them in off the street, not quite off the street, but they would recruit people into the study who had influenza, ask them to breathe in this machine for 30 minutes and um, sample their breath. And what you see in here is that, particularly if you look at the one on the right, the fine aerosol, that first of all, as people cough, they produce more with influenza. That's not necessarily true for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But the biggest thing is if you look at the, the difference between the smallest and the largest um, points on those charts, you can see that there's about a four orders of magnitude difference in the numbers. So there's a huge range between different people. And we see this even more so with COVID. So we see an enormous variation. So it means some people are incredibly infectious, probably a small number. Others don't transmit hardly at all. And that makes it really challenging because we don't know who those people are. Um, if we could identify them, it make life a lot easier. Some of the other challenges are what happens to your breath. And, and I think, you know, the behavior of breath in the air is very complex and particularly when you're very close to somebody. And this is um, uh, done with a thermal imaging camera, which is imaging the exhaled uh, breath in terms of the carbon dioxide in the breath of somebody singing. And you can see that you get a high concentration close to the mouth, and then you can see that it persists. Um, you certainly can see it to the edge of the screen, which is probably about 50 to 70 centimeters from the person. It will persist in a plume for a little bit further than that. You can probably also see that it's starting to, as it comes out, it comes out at the angle of the mouth, but it starts to then curve upwards because it's got some heat from the body. And as it loses momentum, that hot air tries to rise. So we can see already that it's, we've got this complex flow. That flow will carry those particles. Um, if somebody coughs, you get a puff that goes even further. Um, so trying to understand this um, and how this means, what this does when people interact is again, quite a challenge. So that sort of gives a, a feel for the complexity of the starting point. We then have to think about what do we do about this? Um, and again, a slightly complex diagram this with a lot of things on it, but basically trying to show that, that there are, when you've got your infected person on the, the left-hand side, their respiratory activity means that they create different sizes of aerosols. So they create aerosols, small droplets, large droplets, etc. And some of these will deposit onto surfaces, some of these will remain in the air, some of these will be uh, deposited directly into the eyes and nose of a susceptible person. And when we think about how we can mitigate transmission, we think about how the different measures act on these different routes. So for example, if you focus very much on cleaning hands, all you do is tackle some of the things at the bottom triangle you don't tackle any of the things up at the top of the pay, uh, of the, the screen. Similarly, if all you do is ventilate, you just tackle the very top route and you miss all of the stuff to do with hands and surfaces. So 
actually, the first thing is when we're looking at how we mitigate transmission, we have to think through this whole process of how transmission happens and put the right mitigations in place. And if you look carefully, you'll see face coverings appear multiple times on here because they act as a source control on the infected person. They prevent or limit how much is emitted. They also act as to limit how much you inhale. They also have some effect on our touching our faces. So when you are wearing a face covering, you are less likely to touch your nose and your mouth directly. Um, this is another model that people have used around um, thinking about how we prevent transmission, uh, known as the Swiss cheese model. And essentially the idea is that every layer of mitigation has some holes in it. And so you have to have enough layers to stop all the holes. Um, and it's split into personal responsibilities and shared responsibilities. So staying home if you're sick on the left, through to things like ventilation, vaccines, etc. on the right. You'll also notice there's a little mouse in there. The little mouse is known as the misinformation mouse, um, who nibbles away at some of these things because he's the misinformation on the web that says don't wear a mask or vaccines don't work. So uh, yeah, um, quite a nice addition, but uh, makes you think about uh, how, how these things can get uh, eroded if they are not put in place properly. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ventilation. Obviously, this is one of my primary areas of interest. It's one of the things that, um, that uh, you know, I've worked on the most. Um, and again, ventilation is a, a complex thing. Essentially, we're looking at the, the amount of virus that might be in the air and how long it persists in the air. Um, and the diagram sort of illustrates what you call a simple box model where we think about the different rates of things that happen so somebody might be emitting virus that virus once it's in the air can be suspended in the air it might be inhaled by another person it might drop onto surfaces it might get removed by ventilation or by filtration in a room and by starting with something like this we can start to think through how we can model or measure all of these different elements uh, of ventilation and we know that it's a pretty complex um, thing. We know that, that um, the, the effectiveness of ventilation will depend on different factors and depending on the size of the space and the duration of time or how much emission there is will depend on how uh, effective the ventilation is in a particular space. Um, and these again are to show you some of the variabilities in risk. And I know these are, if you're not used to, to graphs, these ones may be a bit more complex, but um, essentially the, there are three, three lines, one which says one Q per hour, 10 Q per hour and 100 Q per hour. So one is, is a very, uh, is uh, quite a low infectious person, somebody who's not emitting very much virus, whereas 100 is a very infectious person who's emitting a lot of virus. And we've got along the bottom, we've got ventilation rate, and then we've got the proportion of people infected. And basically what you sort of see is that when it's only one quanta per hour, which is the ones on the left, the, the number of people infected is really low, um, even at fairly low ventilation rates. But once you go to the far right, you've got a very infectious person. We actually see some really big ranges and it becomes much more difficult to um, understand the, the risks in different settings because you've got so many different factors going on at the same time. And you've got um, such a big variation depending on the time that somebody spends there and the rate of ventilation in a space. So, you know, it, it, it sort of, there's not a sort of simple, if you've got a ventilation rate above a certain number, we're all safe. It really does depend on the actual conditions at the time and who's there and who's emitting this virus. We can use some of these models to look at relative differences. Um, this is a model where we've compared some different scenarios and spaces um, uh, to look at the, the variability in exposure. And the, the first few on the, the, the graph are classrooms, and then we've got some offices, we've got a coffee shop, a supermarket, a gym, and then some outbreak settings. And what you see is things like the supermarket and the coffee shop come out pretty low because people are in there for short periods of time. And particularly in the supermarket, 
it was assumed to be a very large space. Whereas classrooms and offices start to come out higher simply because people are there for many hours together sharing the same air. And on the far right, we end up some very high ones because these are the ones where we've got high levels of activity in a poorly ventilated space over a reasonable duration of time. And that gives us a much higher relative exposure. Um, just to illustrate some of the real complexities in this as well, <coughs> this is a, a computational fluid dynamics model which looks at the behaviour of different particles. The particles are bigger than they would be in reality, so we can see them. And it, it's basically modelling, a, a, um, we've got a pseudo person and how, what would happen if they talk or cough. Um, and then the top line, you've got, if there's a screen in the way, and the bottom line, you've got no screen. And what we see is that the screen blocks some of the big droplets. So the red ones are the really big ones that drop out the air. The blue ones are the smaller ones. But then in both cases, some of those small particles um, evaporate and disappear into the air and then get dispersed around the room. And you can see that over time, that these particles fill the room and if the room is badly ventilated they may fill the room to an extent that we that people could breathe them in so this starts to make us think about ventilation and i'm going to want, want to sort of move on now and think about what this means for going forward what have we learned um, because one of the things that covid has done is it's shone a bit of a spotlight on our environments it's made us think about the quality of our environments and made us realise that we've got a legacy of really poorly ventilated buildings. So we've ended up with a set of questions which are quite difficult. You know, we don't actually know what is the ventilation in many of our buildings. Um, it's difficult to measure, and particularly a building that's naturally ventilated through the windows rather than through a mechanical system. It's very difficult to measure it. But even if we can measure the ventilation, we know what it is. We don't necessarily know what whether it's the right value for health. And that's not just for COVID, it's for all of the other health-based aspects around air quality and ventilation. And then even if we can find this out, we don't really know very much about how the ventilation of the building is linked into how people behave and how much they understand about ventilation. Um, so a piece of work that uh, I was involved with over the past uh, few months um, was a commission directly from Sir Patrick Vallance, which was to the Royal Academy of Engineering, which said, how can we make our buildings be more resilient to infection? And it was strategically, what's the long term challenge? And then what should we be doing before winter to try and make sure that our buildings are as safe as possible um, over the, the next few months. Um, so I was part of an expert group in here, um, but the Royal Academy of Engineering conducted a set of evidential hearings, worked with owners and operators across different sectors to try and understand what we know about our buildings. <coughs> Some of the stuff in the evidential hearings was really interesting, and it really showed that there's a huge variability in people's understanding and in people's um, knowledge, both of how the virus transmits and in how they interpret guidance. So we found that some organizations knew reasonably well what they were doing. They were fairly comfortable. We found others that, that were, were stuck. They didn't know what numbers to use. They didn't know how to interpret the guidance very well. Um, Many of them talked about still focusing on cleaning surfaces, even though they weren't sure that that was the right thing to be doing, just because it reassured people um, rather than the and, and rather than find the ventilation and, and which doesn't mean anything necessarily to people in a building. So just some of the quotes that we got, but it, it sort of really illustrated that people there was a real variation um, in what people were able to do and what they understood. Um, and that really linked back to guidance. Um, I think it's also worth identifying around, you know, a little bit of history around this. So um, what is a good ventilation, right? Uh, and, and I'm not gonna, not gonna test anybody in numbers here, but it's quite interesting when you start looking at the history of this. Um, the very earliest 
stuff um, around ventilation was from 1836, which basically calculated how much ventilation we need to deal with metabolic needs. Um, we then go up into uh, Nightingale's era. Um, we, we have values around disease, and it's probably the only time in history we've actually had guidance values for ventilation based on disease. But then, of course, um, antibiotics come in. Um, we also get energy efficiency come in. We get developments of air conditioning systems come into buildings. And for many years, we sit at much lower levels. Um, you can see they dip really low in the 1970s when there was an energy crisis. They go up again in the 1980s because smoking was introduced in buildings. And we've gone up again slightly since uh, about 1990. Um, which are, are, are recognised as contaminants. I don't know what the right ventilation is. Um, it's been suggested it should be much higher. It's very difficult to know, but it's you know some really difficult questions in there. We also know that for many of our buildings that we cannot just take our existing building and ventilate it more because there's a whole raft of different competing challenges in there. We know that um, many places have poor outdoor air quality, so you cannot just open the windows, you deal with, you've got issues with noise, security, comfort, cost of uh, heating a building. Um, and the fact that actually, until now, with the exception of hospitals, we've not really thought about whether a transmission of infection in most buildings. Um, so it's something that's really needs to be brought in but we need to think about it in the round with a whole raft of other things too. And this ties into a strategic problem. And the strategic problem is actually really quite deep. And this was something else we found from the Royal Academy of Engineering work that actually we have a legacy of really poor performing buildings, not just in terms of ventilation and air quality, but in terms of structural safety, fire safety, etc. There is a, 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 the, the Hackett report looked at this in the context of Grenfell and fire safety and, and identified that the whole there are some cultural issues across the whole of the construction sector. But we do have some real challenges that we've got problems with compliance, we've got technology solutions that don't actually work in reality. We've got um, unintended consequences. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've we um, spent a lot of time sealing our buildings up from a heat and energy perspective, but not thought through what that means in terms of uh, air quality and ventilation. And then it it's all comes down to things like skills, training and knowledge um, across the whole sector. We, so it's, I actually identified some real challenges that I think is gonna take a long time to be resolved. And we have a big practical conundrum with this. We, we, you know, the vast majority of our buildings exist. We are not going to knock them all down and start again. Um, we have a real challenge with now, how do we make sure that we ventilate them well, are comfortable and are energy efficient? And what are the, how do we make sure we balance that off, particularly with spaces that where we need to retrofit them um, and spaces that have been converted are now occupied by more people than they should be in there. Um, I think it's flagging that, you know, there are, what are the right ventilation standards for specific settings? We've got um, generic guidance, we've got guidance for specialist environments such as parts of healthcare, but things like transport, schools, primary care, what's the right values, how should we do this? And then the other interesting challenge that's come along is the, um, the advent of things like air cleaning technologies, novel technologies for trying to solve some of these challenges. Some of these are great, they're appropriate. There are also a bunch of snake oil sellers out there and they are quite aggressive at marketing things. So how do we actually identify which are the good technologies that are the things that will allow us to improve our buildings? Um, I should also flag that we know a lot of this. We know that, that there's a reason we should be investing in better buildings. We know that uh, there's, there's good research out there that says your environment is good for your sleep, your productivity, your performance, your mental health, your respiratory health. Um, there's some nice data from um, Denmark, which suggests that poor indoor air quality in offices can reduce productivity by somewhere between six and 9%. That's nearly half a day a week. In, for employees in a company, that starts to add up. Um, if you go back before the pandemic, um, 2019, 5.3 million workdays were lost due to respiratory infections in the UK, huge. 
huge numbers. And US data, over 20 years ago, they, they've done calculations on this. Better again, annual gains from better indoor air quality would be over $40 billion per year. You could argue, why are we not doing this already? Um, I think it's difficult because it's not tangible. We can see energy in buildings as a more tangible thing than health. But actually, if we could invest in our environments better, we might have a really good impact on public health uh, across the, whole, the whole of the UK and the world. I wanted to touch on behaviours as well. So a lot of what I've mentioned there is around the engineering side of it, and including the regulatory. Um, but some real examples of behaviour. So uh, I think one of the most stark examples around behaviour and technology is around masks. We know that masks work. We know you can do uh, you can do tests on the materials. We know that they block the aerosols. We know that if you put them on people who have the virus, they will reduce the emissions. We know that if you're wearing a good quality mask, it will reduce the amount of, of inhalation. But we can't see it at a population scale, and that's because of behaviours. So that's because although we know that materials work, people don't always choose the right materials. They don't, masks don't fit properly. We also know that not enough people wear them, or when they do wear them, they don't wear them properly. They're wearing them underneath their nose or on their chin, which really isn't going to do anything at all. And then we know that when people do wear them, they maybe only wear them for you know, 10 minutes when they're walking down the corridor rather than uh, several hours when they're sat in a shared space. And we know that actually the reasons for this are really complex. We can't just sort of turn around and say everybody should wear a mask because there's a whole raft of, of, of human reasons why people don't want to wear masks, don't like wearing masks and are uncomfortable with masks. And so actually it's really important that we think about how the technology and the human behaviour go together here. And it also links into ventilation. So um, one of the things I've experienced over the course of this is that uh, policymakers, uh, well, everybody actually wants to find a magic bullet, wants a simple message, wants a message like wash your hands for 20 seconds for ventilation. Ventilation is complicated, it's messy, it's, it's variable and it changes all the time. Public knowledge has become, you know, uh, uh, public knowledge is a window equals ventilation a lot of the times. And, and actually, again, ventilation is more complex than that. And unless you understand how the virus transmits, you don't necessarily understand why ventilation matters. And then we also see some challenges with organisations. So, again, organisations are not necessarily aware of why it matters. They lack skills. But there's also another behavioural thing in that they're fearful of what will be found. So they don't necessarily go and look for things that might be fearful of, of costs and the consequences of it. So we have a lot of the, the although we know we can mitigate some things, it's not going to be perfect. We do have to think about how does the technology, the infrastructure link in with people's behaviours, people's beliefs, people's feelings. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was, was something slightly different, which was the science of a pandemic. Um, so uh, this first graph here shows uh, data on research carried out on two different pathogens, influenza and SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. If you look at influenza, it stretches back to 1917 and it was somehow popular then. And you can see that over the years, if you look at the scientific literature, there's a steady increase in the numbers of, of studies that have looked at influenza. And at the time this was, search was done, there were 134,000 studies looked at influenza. SARS-CoV-2, of course, didn't exist until um, uh, just over, well, ne nearly two years ago now. We now have 93,000 papers on this virus, so almost as many as we've got on influenza um, in over 100 years. So you can start to see that the, those, the, the amount of research that's been done incredibly fast is huge, and we have to sift through it all, which is where one of the challenges lies. Um, one of the other challenges we found with um, 
this disease is tackling some of the beliefs. So I, I've highlighted earlier the, the comments around, is it an aerosol, is it a droplet? Early stages uh, in the pandemic, everything was focused on hand washing. We were all told it was droplet. In fact, the WHO even put out a message to say this is not airborne, and they've never corrected that message, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, but there were quite a number of us really from early on who thought this is this is wrong, that, that there is an airborne route to this disease too, and we need to flag this. So we did some analysis of a, one of the super spreading events, um, and then a group of people um, in the, uh, back in June 2020 um, put a letter to in a clinical infectious disease journal saying we must address airborne transmission. Um, so I was one of 35 scientists who wrote that letter. Um, it was signed by 239 people. Um, it was it received uh, media attention worldwide and that was the point where um, the world said okay we possibly ought to consider airborne transmission. And put, but it was a big international effort to change that understanding. We're still tackling some of that um, embedded beliefs about how disease is transmitted. Um, another thing that is actually a real challenge is that everything is happening so fast, but at the same time, for many people, it feels too slow. And everybody has a view on everything. So whether it's the media, whether it's other scientists, social media uh, is a complicated space, the public. There are a whole bunch of lobby groups um, that have sprung up that are, who are lobbying for everything. Um, when you're carrying out a scientific study, you uh, have some of the studies are very high profile, particularly one we've got running at the moment, which is using air purifiers in Bradford schools. And, you know, everybody is convinced that you've done it wrong before you've even started. They want to know exactly what's happening. They put in FOI requests all the time. It's quite, a, an, an, in, quite an interesting challenge doing research in that environment. We also find that we've got a lot of bias in studies. So people are, if they see a study that supports their view, they tend to be very favorable to it. If they see a study that doesn't, they are often uh, quite critical of it. I think we probably all of us who are involved in, in this have, to have some biases, um, even if we try not to. Um, I think there's a challenge around the standards that we, we place on, on evidence. So um, public health interventions like masks, like ventilation are very hard to evaluate. And yet there are people who want a randomized controlled trial to prove it works before they'll accept it. And that leads to all the way through, we've had the challenge of what's the burden of proof that it works versus putting in a precautionary approach. Um, there have been some real benefits to the way science has worked over the past 18 months or so. Um, everybody focused on one thing, um, and that has led to a huge amount of collaboration um, and awareness of different disciplines that I think was not there before. We've had a lot of rapid routes for getting science and policymakers talking to each other. Um, and I think there's been the most enormous commitment of scientists, engineers, practitioners, uh, policymakers worldwide to try and solve this. And, and I think, you know, people, sh many of the scientists should be hugely applauded for the, the effort that they put in with, um, on, uh, on trying to tackle this from all across the world. Um, I've had quite a lot of experience thrown in at the deep end slightly of how, how to communicate evidence and that's really interesting in that you have to be, you have to think through the quality of it and think about the precautions because I'm aware that the things we write change everybody's lives and that's quite a big responsibility. Um, we also learned quite quickly that you have to make things simple, you have to but not lose the detail. Um, and we have to use appropriate terminologies for different audiences to understand. So it's a real challenge getting that communication across well. I'm going to just close by think, saying, what do we do next? I think there is, we're starting to come out of the immediate um, complexity of this, and we're now going into 
the long term and how do we do things in the long term. Coming back to the Royal Academy of Engineering piece, I think there is now a focus. We, we need to think about what's the strategic challenge, how do we actually move forward so we don't end up in this position again and that's about thinking from my perspective about how our buildings are done differently um, and how we enable things infection resilience to be in there with net zero with building safety we have got some projects which are tackling this so this is the protect study which is a very large government funded project looking at transmission and trying to understand this complex picture of how the environment, the virus and people behave. There are over 150 researchers working on this um, project at the moment. I, I um, lead theme two of this and we have I think 15 different organisations who are running projects under that to, to try and tackle our gaps in knowledge around COVID-19. Um, on a wider level, we've got a, a network, and if it's something, if you're interested in buildings at all, you're very welcome to, to get in touch with us on this network, because we, we run quite a lot of seminars and some general interest stuff, as well as uh, the, more, um, the more complex, detailed research aspects of it. But we're thinking about how indoor and air, outdoor air quality is connected, how do we ventilate buildings for health, and the looking through from the physics of that all the way through to the regulation. Of that and I'm going to finish by saying this is where I hope we go a paradigm shift something where we think about the built environment differently where we think about human centered design um, thinking about health outcomes as, as the measures for why a building is a good building thinking about a, taking a more holistic approach to how we design buildings and cities together um, and how we recognize that it's complex and not try and simplify it down to something that means we end up failing. Um, but think this through in terms of the, the longer term picture of from policy through to how we design, train, educate, and make sure we've got the capabilities and capacities to do this properly. And I'm gonna stop there. I think I've probably talked for a bit too long, but uh, hopefully I've still got you with me. Thank you, Kath. Great talk, uh, virtual clapping all round, I think. Um, now, we, uh, we, we, we do have some time for questions. Um, you can either um, uh, put up your hand and our, uh, Rachel and I will spot you, uh, or you can write questions in the chat and uh, Rachel or I will, will read them out. Um, could, could I start, Kath, by, by asking you, I mean, uh, I, I don't think it's even a matter of argument. There are countries around the world who've done much better than the UK and the USA on, um, on any COVID measure, whether it's cases or deaths, uh, hospitalizations, etc. Um, but of course, all, I mean, all of your work and you know, many of the studies you've cited come from the UK and the USA. You, you know, so. Okay. Can you comment on, uh, say, South Korea, Taiwan, China itself? Um, you, you know, are buildings there having an impact uh, and were they even in part responsible uh, for their better um, outcomes? It's, it is very hard to say, and I guess it will depend on whereabouts. So uh, I couldn't really comment on China. Um, I think if you look at somewhere like Hong Kong, for example, though, um, which obviously they experienced SARS in 2003. Um, so they did have a different starting point there. After, after the SARS outbreak, they did do things to their buildings, particularly healthcare. Um, they also are more readily wear masks, but I think it's very easy to say it's the masks and it's the buildings, but actually it's the whole of their infrastructure. It's the whole of the systems. And ultimately it's not so much one thing, it's about how you add all of that, those measures together. Um, and I think many of those countries who have managed it better have taken a different strategic view on things, plus added maybe into some things like ventilation and mask wearing. and behaviours. Um, I think they, because they'd already had experiences of a pandemic before, 
they adopted a more precautionary note right from the start and they were more fearful because they knew what could happen. I think we were arrogant, to be honest, at the beginning. I think we thought we, 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 it wouldn't affect us and it did. I mean, we, um, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, there is this, this contrary pressure uh, to um, uh, be energy efficient and cut down all form of loss of energy. And that, that's, you, you know, uh, really hermetically sealing our, uh, our buildings, isn't it? I mean, we, we do this all the time. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, what about these kind of conflicting pressures? Yes, and I think one of the challenges we have in the UK is that we seal our buildings, but we don't replace it with something. So many other countries seal their buildings, but replace it with a mechanical ventilation system. And we don't do that. It's, it's still a bit alien to us to have mechanical ventilation, particularly in our homes, but even in many workplaces. So, and it is absolutely critical that if we seal things up, we have to put ventilation, in. not just for COVID, but for general health. I think, you know, we've, we've probably all worked or lived or been in really poorly ventilated spaces. And it's not pleasant. It's, you, yeah. you feel it. You can feel the effects yeah. on it. Yeah. Now, there's been quite a few questions coming in, so I'm going to read some out. Um, uh, Christine Holtstock says, is it better to ventilate a room by extracting stale air or blowing in fresh air? Oh, that's an interesting question. So an extract will eventually move it, but actually blowing in fresh air um, distributes the air better in the space. It, it, so, but in a way you need a bit of both. Um, it's and it's quite difficult to do one without the other, um, but yeah, and, and many buildings, it, it's yeah, you you need some active air movement for it to work well in many buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've got a question from uh, Esme Daly, age thirteen. Great. Uh, what can a student at high school say or do to help improve ventilation at their school? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Esme, and thank you for that. Um, so I think. Uh, you know, schools should be thinking about how they can manage ventilation. Um, it is quite variable depending on different schools because some schools manage it more easily than others. Um, I think raising awareness is one of the first things. So under, if, if people understand how the virus transmits, then they can understand why it's important to ventilate. And until you understand that, it's, it's difficult to make the case for why you need to ventilate. Um, Many schools it will be through opening windows and often that is a challenge when it's cold. But actually, if you open windows, even if you just open them for you know, a few minutes every hour, or make sure you open them during break times to flush out some of the, the, the air in the room, that can really help. So you can then kind of balance between having windows open all the time, which is going to make you cold, versus opening them all, a sort, of, a sort of regularly uh, can really help. Um, I'm hoping that schools will soon have carbon dioxide meters and those can be used to, to, to identify whether we've got poor ventilation. They, they are rolling them out from the Department for Education. They're just, you can imagine actually if you, if you put in an order for half a million carbon dioxide meters, it takes a little while to get them. Um, it's not quite the same as us buying a couple of them on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess it doesn't have the same kind of ring to it as ventilators, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we, we had the Secretary of State for Health going on TV and say, anybody who can make ventilators, make ventilators. <laughs> and we have reached the point. I think the industry sadly, did respond to that as well, actually. They, they did. Uh, and sadly, we have reached the point where they've stopped throwing huge money at it. I mean, there is still money going into things, um, but not at that level. Um, and, and some of these things, you know, there's even challenges with supply routes because, you know, a carbon dioxide meter requires chips in it and those chips come from China. Yeah, yeah. So, we, uh, so some more questions here. Um, uh, I mean, one is uh, from Bridget Reed at um, excellent presentation. Whilst public building work will take time, how can we raise awareness? Reventilation in our homes and cars, and I think there was a, another uh, related one from Rachel actually about you know what uh, what do you say to to people 
uh, who are not wearing masks? Uh, and how do you convince them that it's beneficial for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, again, these are quite difficult. Some, you write about how do we raise that awareness? And one of the challenges is there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. Um, I mean, I think, I think being able to point to some of the scientific uh, information is helpful. Um, there are government campaigns which come out. There's a new one coming out next week, I believe, on, uh, or perhaps the end of this week, uh, on ventilation. And some of these things really help illustrate how how ventilation matters. Um, I think it's, some of it is about trying to share when you have got good information, trying to share it. And the mask wearing is a real challenge because, you know, I mean, I don't go up to people in the street and challenge them. I'm not brave enough to do that. But, um, you know, I think about talking about the, I suppose it's about trying to counter the misinformation. And that's very hard to do because a lot of that misinformation is, it's quite uh, targeted and is often is made to sound very scientific, even when it's not. Um, so I think there is a huge challenge there. Thank you. Uh, James Doyle is saying, should we still be wearing masks with more diligence than in, in recent months? And could, could I just add to that? Uh, I mean, where are we going with mask and face cover wearing? I, I mean, do you think this is going to be as common in the West as it has been in the East? Or are we going through a cultural shift about this? What, what do you think about the present, about James's point and the future? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think in the, the next few months, I would like to see more people wearing masks just because our cases are really high. We're going into, we're heading into winter with an already overwhelmed NHS. Uh, and I think if, you know, wearing a mask is quite a small thing to do to try and protect against that. And I'm aware not everybody can wear a mask and there are challenges there, but a lot of people can. And so I think, you know, it, it, we've been told to do things as personal choice now, but I think personal choice has to be about how does your personal choice affect other people? Um, and we need to think about collective choice. And for the people who can't wear masks, if those of us who can wear them more diligently, we provide that protection to them too. Um, cultural shift? I don't know. I, I think masks have become really politicised. Um, and I think there will be a group of people who will wear them more diligently for, for the foreseeable future because they will wear them when they've got a cold or they'll wear them when they're cautious. I've certainly loved the fact I've now got a box of FFP3 masks and I put one on when I go and clean the garage out and I don't start sneezing anymore. And I think, why didn't I do this years ago? <laughs> so I think, you know, perhaps we've learned a little bit about wearing masks for other reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, the whether where it goes long term, I don't know. You do tend to see that people follow each other's behaviour as well. So if you get on a train and lots of people are wearing masks, you're more likely to keep it on. Whereas if you're the only one, people are more likely to take them off. And, and I think that is a real issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, Warren is asking about uh, UV. Um, and you, you didn't really say very much about UV. I mean, I, I know that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of engineering solutions that are building UV into uh, ventilation systems. What, what's your feeling about uh, about UV? Yeah, I mean, it's something. It was the thing I cut my teeth on in uh, you know 20 years ago when I first started working in this field, which was UV air cleaners. Um, I think they do have a lot of potential. Um, there are different types. Um, some work better than others. Um, and then some of the, the, there's some real complexity in how we get into work. We've been working on something called far UV recently and looking at trying to, um, which is a safer wavelength, um, which we can use. I noticed a comment just so about, about UV masks. Um, it's quite tricky to put it into a face mask and particularly because it is um, something that actually can, uh, if, if you're exposed to it, particularly the, the normal wavelengths of UV that we use, it can actually damage your skin quite badly. But there are systems where it's like a, an air hood type thing, which will have a UV 
purifier in them. Um, so they do exist. Um, I think the best, the most, I think we will see increased use of UV in air cleaners in buildings going forward, but it doesn't seem to have taken off that much yet. Great. Now, do we have any more questions? I think I've worked through the list. And um, well, actually, Chris and Anne Bennett have asked uh, Kath, are you, uh, is your department having a Christmas party and are you going? We're at university, we're not allowed Christmas parties. <laughs> I just see Marissa on the screen, she'll attest to that. We're not allowed Christmas parties. Oh. But actually, um, people do have them. Um, I'm, to be honest, unsure. There is, there is one being organised for our Centre for Doctoral Training. Um, certainly we've... It, it, we've advised that you know that, that if we do it we have it in a bigger room we have it spaced out a bit more um we have some quite good controls in place i haven't quite decided whether i'm going or not yet that's, that's still something i'm toying with <laughs> interesting to to hear that um you say about even you with all your knowledge still finding it difficult to resist peer pressure about you know if you're the only one behaving in a way that looks too cautious or whatever and, and not uh, wanting to challenge people who are not behaving in a way that you as a scientist would consider most sensible um, even I as a bold person used to speaking in public and used to sticking my neck out find that really awkward and so I'm sure that, uh, you know, because I'm probably at one end of the normal distribution on that, but I've found myself in, uh, we've just started playing orchestra again, and I'm a string player, I can play with a, with a mask on, and I was the only one two weeks in a row with a mask on all the way through the rehearsal. Now, I don't know whether people think that I'm being paranoid, I'm not, I just think it's sensible, but it's really that sort of thing that you're talking about, the complexity of how these things fold in on each other and, and stop us doing things that e even, even when we might have quite a lot of knowledge and, and a determination to, to be sensible. It's a really hard one, isn't it? It is, and I think we do need to explore the complexity of human behaviour a lot more with this. I think that's one of my really big take homes from the whole pandemic is that, you know, I, I, as an engineer, I'm focused more on the technology side. I've always known behaviour matter, but never quite to this extent. And the people I've got, I've probably learned the most from as behavioural scientists. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really then made me think about the the limitations of some of what we do or when we do things to make sure that we think through the behaviors um so i mean there are there are many many examples out there of you know engineering technologies which get brought in and are used really badly because nobody knows what to do with them you know you get the controls on the air conditioning system in a in your meeting room nobody can work them out you just press some buttons and hope for the best until mm -hmm. you, you get the right temperature mm -hmm. or um you know lighting in buildings which comes on and goes off and you're never quite sure what you, you know nobody's given you any instructions and I think there's some real there's a real disconnect between how 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 somebody designed a building and thought it should work compared to what people do with it in reality. That's very interesting to hear so the interdisciplinary aspects of, of what you've been working with and and your aspirations are, are really coming out strongly through this last couple of years of experience aren't they? Yes yeah absolutely and I think you know I think that individual disciplines have definitely got a contribution to make but it's so much more powerful when they're tied up together and we can think through those the 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 you know the, the limitations but the opportunities as well yes indeed okay well um Kath, thank you so much for uh, such a uh, a wonderful and thought thought-provoking talk uh, where uh, i think in true priestly uh, tradition we, we we've thought about everything and challenged everything and uh you know um good, good things must must come out of this and uh, our buildings must be better and people must be must be more, more aware, aware of everything. So um, th uh, thank you very much for a, a, great, uh, a great priestly lecture. Um, now I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hand back to Rachel uh, in, uh, in a moment, uh, but um, 
Uh, I, I just like, uh, like to say to everybody, ha have a look at our website. We have a new website. Uh, it will give you a lot, a lot of information about us. If you, um, uh, to, to, to those of you who are our members, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, to those of you who are not our members and our visitors, thank you also for coming. And maybe consider, um, uh, consider joining LPLS. There's plenty of information uh, on, the, on the website. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't apply to ESME at age 13, but uh, we do have a, have a, have a young age group, uh, uh, kind of uh, free, free membership type rate for the 18 to 25 year olds. So ESME, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait a, a year or two yet, uh, for that. But um, we have an associate member, uh, uh, associate membership for, for young people. Thank you. So, Rachel, would you like to Take tell us what's coming up here? Coming next, yes. Yeah, so, share a screen. Yes, we've got um, coming up in the middle of the month um, a talk by this professor from Cambridge who's been very strongly involved in the Mars mission. And he's going to talk about the implications of this mission for how we can un understand what goes on here and how we might interact with Mars in the future. Um, uh, he's, he was in any, any case going to do it online as uh, he has family commitments in Cambridge that would preclude him being able to come here. So, and then it turns out that um, uh, yours truly is giving a talk in early December. Um, it remains to be seen whether it actually is in Leeds Museum or whether I'm going to be here with these same old books behind me. Um, but uh, it's celebrating the fact that it's 200 years since the, the Phil and Lit opened their very own premises in Park Row. And uh, the museum is also celebrating because the original hall included a museum. And so it's 200 years since Leeds had its uh, first proper museum. So it's a... a, a collaboration of various kinds. So I'm a tour guide who's been doing tours about this in any case, and we'll do uh, tours related to this topic uh, in between Christmas and New Year. Um, but uh, the talk will focus particularly on the fill and lit and what Leeds was like at that time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody. And. Uh... Uh, we'll say good night to everybody and uh, uh, stay safe and look forward to seeing you again. All Thank you for inviting me. It's been really nice to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. All the best. Thanks very much indeed. Great. Good, well done. Mm. Well, that was good, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah she's a marvellous yeah. speaker, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, that there are there are other things in molecular biology. <laughs> yes it's very interesting that she, well she managed to pack so much in didn't she about so many yeah. levels of the of the science and the application of the science and how the science has moved on and yeah i i, I don't